Well, just after five o'clock here in the morning, about 5.06, 5.07, a um, little bit of sunrise left there. It was really beautiful earlier. Tried to get out here as quick as I could uh, to try and capture some of the sunrise, but uh, not as magnificent as it was, but you still get to see some fireweed over here and uh, things, beautiful wild flowers here in Northern Maine. But uh, I'm gonna talk today about a call to holiness. Um, I've been doing these, a call to righteousness, a call to sobriety. I've been doing these out at lakes and things, but just thought I'd do one here this morning. Missed most of the sunrise, unfortunately, but uh, this one here has been a real conviction to me, this call to holiness, because I realized how much holiness I'm forsaking. And a lot of things I do aren't very holy. And so I pray that this is a good conviction to you. Um, and just to explain this, um, because I'm not going to get into a lot of references on the Holy Spirit, but um, God's Holy Spirit will speak through a preacher and convict you of sin. And lost people will attack the preacher. They'll say, well, it's just his standards, it's his beliefs, it's his interpretation of the Bible. But if you're saved, you'll understand when it's the Holy Spirit and when it's just my speech. Uh, when I'm just saying things that are okay well he's you know messed that up a little bit whatever well, that's me but when the holy spirit speaks to you through the scriptures you'll understand and you'll be convicted and if you want to be right with god you're going to say you know what i'm really convicted by that i need to change so just to give you a little uh foretaste of what's coming here you can turn in your king james bible to first peter chapter one this is definitely one you want to look at the scriptures. I'm going to be going over a, a bunch of them. And um, we'll see how this goes. I might have to stop occasionally to reapply some uh, mosquito repellent. I have little spots here and there that aren't quite dry yet from our homemade mosquito repellent. But uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, called a sobriety, hmm, being sober, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Is that true for a Christian? Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely, it's, it's there. But gird up the loins of your mind. Um, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Paul wrote about that. Lines up with what Peter's saying here. All scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We're going to be going over a lot of scriptures today, back to the Old Testament under the, the law. Um, there's a lot of scriptures that talk about holiness. We'll see about that. Verse 14, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. You don't fashion your life as a Christian in, uh, according to the former lusts when you were lost, when you were ignorant of God's righteousness, of God's standards, of what the Bible teaches. Don't go back to that life. That's what it's saying there. Verse 15, and here's where it gets really interesting. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. I just I was absolutely shocked a while back when I did a, a thing, a, you know, things a Christian will not do. It wasn't called, it, I think it was 10 things a Christian will not do or something. Um, and people were upset because I said Christians don't use profanity. Um, our, our conversation, our speech, and, and conversation in the King James Bible, not is, it's, it's, it's not just speech, it's actions. I realize that. But um, your conversation should be holy. Your speech should be holy. Verse 16, because it is written, referring back to the Old Testament, in other words, be ye holy, for I am holy. Now that right there is an amazing, amazing scripture. God actually says, there's an attribute about me, the Lord. I'm holy. 
And you say, well, we can't attain to, to godhood. Well, that's true. We can't be gods. But uh, when it comes to holiness, God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. Wow. Wow. So don't tell me, oh, there's just certain things, you know, you, you just, as a Christian, you, you can never be uh, real holy or real sanctified or, or perfect. You know, the Bible says, that, uh, you know, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Uh, you know, I have a whole study on the thing of what does that mean? Um, you're supposed to be holy. God expects a higher standard out of you, Christian. Uh, than he does out of the lost world. They're in their ignorance. Jesus is dying on the cross. He says, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. They're ignorant. People out there, they're foolish. They don't. The, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to them. They don't understand. But you, God expects holiness as he is holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Hmm. You say, well, how in the world do I do that? That's what the book's for, to tell you how to do that. But it said there, it is written. So let's look back where it was written. Leviticus chapter 11. Turn back there in your Old Testament, back towards the beginning of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, the third book. This is when the law comes in, and they're being told all the different things that, that the Lord expects of them. Leviticus chapter 11 Verses 43 through 45. Ye shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creepeth, neither shall ye make them, or make yourselves unclean with them, that ye should be defiled thereby. It's talking about uh, eating snakes or, or other things, you know, that creep around on the ground, millipedes or centipedes or, you know, worms and things. You're not supposed to eat those because that makes you unclean. All right. That's what it's talking about there in context. But I'm going to you know, give you an interesting little way to look at this. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. There's the first two references to be holy, for I am holy. Okay? So, what's an easy thing to remember? How can you be holy? Uh, well, very simple. Stay away from creeps. <laughs> um, don't walk around with people and get around people that try to bring your standards down. Um, if you want to be holy, you should improve every year. More victory over sin. More sanctification. More reading your Bible being used of the Lord more to witness to people and whatever else, the Lord sets that stuff up. Again, you go out and you try to set that stuff up on your own and just, you know, force it and whatever else, forced conversions of people like the Hiles cult has done to get the people into their churches to get their money. Uh, that stuff is satanic. Don't make false conversions. That's not the work of the Lord. All right. But uh, every year there should be improvement. But you get around these uh, professing Christians and they say, well, you know, I don't think it's a big deal if you do this sin or if, you know, okay, I, I do smoke a little bit and I, I you know, I, I drink a little bit, you know, maybe sometimes too much. And, and you know, I, I do eat this junk food here and, and you know, I, I mean, okay, I don't play them all the time, but I like video games, you know, it's, it's good, you know, to unwind after work. What are they trying to do? They're trying to bring your standards down. They're trying to make you less holy. Get away from them. It's what the Bible teaches. We could go over all the scriptures. I've talked about them in plenty of other sermons. But when you see people that are trying to take away your holiness, um, they're putting you in direct violation against God. Because God says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. You say, well, it's in the Old Testament. It's in the Old Testament. We can, we can ignore it. Well, we're going to see that there's commands for holiness for a Christian in the Pauline epistles. So no, you can't duck it. But uh, let's think about this for a minute. Well, it's in the Old Testament, so we'll just ignore it. So in other words, God told people under the law that were not part of the body of Christ. Um, he told them to be holy, for I am holy. And yet you, 
what your bone of his bones, flesh of his flesh, according to First Corinthians 12, I think it is. Um, you're, you're one spirit with the Lord. His Holy Spirit's within you. And you don't have to be holy. Think about the logic of that. Uh, no, there's supposed to be holiness in your life. And you say, well, it, it should be there. And, and the, all the games that these lost people will play, they'll mess around with the Word of God. They will rest the Scriptures unto their own destruction, as the Bible says. But let's go to the next reference here to holiness. Go next to Leviticus 19, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Hmm. All the congregation. You say, well, holiness is only the position of a preacher. If you're a preacher, you're some kind of pastor, Bible teacher, whatever. You got to be holy, an evangelist, maybe a missionary. Yeah, sure. But I'm just a regular old Christian. I just go to my job and whatever else. I don't in order for me to keep my job, I don't, I can't really take all the stands that the Bible tells me to, because then I would offend the wrong people. I'd get, probably end up getting fired and whatever. Um, all the congregation. All right. Are you part of the congregation, the body of Christ? I think so. If you're saved. Okay. Then be holy. What well, might cost me my job? Um, then who's providing for you? Well, I can trust the Lord, you know, and can you really? Can you trust him to get you a different job if your holiness gets you fired? Ouch. Oh, there's more coming. Leviticus chapter 20. Well, I can trust the Lord. I can trust the Lord, but I'm just going to do whatever the government tells me to do because of a, a virus that doesn't even exist. Uh, it's a phony little baloney thing and whatever else that they're creating to scare people into social engineering and submitting to uh, a fascist dictatorship. Uh, I, I trust the Lord. Okay, then why'd you shut your church building down, hypocrites? I trust the Lord, but I got to wear this little face mask on, on my mouth here because I, I don't want to get sick. And if I get sick, I can self-quarantine myself. And other people might get sick and don't even know that they have it. And 93%, I think it is now, uh, recover from this thing. But I, I, I have to do what the government tells me to do because, after all... <laughs> uh-huh. You're to be different than the lost world. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 through 8. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy. Holiness comes from sanctification. What is sanctification? You're setting yourself apart from the lost world. You should look different. You should act different. You should speak different. For I am the Lord your God, and ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. Notice it doesn't say that uh, you sanctify yourself by going to church and you wear your nice little uniform and whatever else that the church tells you to wear and, and things and you no god sanctifies you how does god sanctify you um by convicting you of sin that you're doing that has to go that has to stop that's the way the lord does it be holy for i am holy next one's really good though go down to verse 26 here in Leviticus chapter 20, go down to verse 26. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I am the I the Lord am holy, and have severed you from other people, that ye should be mine. Severed you from other people. Hmm. How about that one? Uh, well, you know, we got to be like the lost world to win the world. <laughs> That's one of my favorite ones that the uh, modern professing Christians try to come out with. I hate these modern churches. They're just so disgusting. They're vile. I've been in them. I just can't stand them. Uh, the rock concerts, the immodest clothing, the just the, the oh man, just disgusting. Um, <laughs> whatever. But uh, God severed us from the lost world. You see, when he saves you, he purchases you. He says, you're mine. Um, you're not going to be 
able to fellowship with that lost world anymore. And you, you understand what I mean. If you've been saved for a while, there's times that you, you know, mess up or whatever else and you try to be good to the lost world and, and, and you get around them and whatever else and you try to kind of fit in. You can't fit in anymore, you know. The, the, when you've gone through the process of sanctification, you have so little in common with lost people. You can talk about the weather, you know, I guess that's okay to talk about with lost people sometimes if you're trying to be nice to them, but uh, not much else. Oh, who do you think is going to win the election? Well, if you want my honest opinion, they're all controlled by the Catholic Church, and we don't really have elections anymore. We have selections. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter who gets in. They're all just going to be servants of the devil. You know, if you're honest enough to tell them the truth. Oh, okay, well, uh, you know, and they walk away. Um, you know, you, you don't understand what I mean. You can't be around lost people. Why? God severs you. Cuts off those relationships. Oh, come on, here, come with me. I own you now. Romans chapter 12. Now we'll go to the New Testament. For all the hyper dispensationalists that are jumping up and down and screaming, he's reading verses out of the law under the, Le the book of Leviticus. It's He's going back to the law to prove doctrine for a Christian today. Oh, he can't do it. Oh, oh, we don't have to be holy for I'm holy. That's not written to a Christian. Oh, oh. Well, let's see about this. Romans chapter 12. Severed from the lost back there in Leviticus chapter 20. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, there's that word, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Is it reasonable for God to change your life? Mm -hmm. Is it reasonable for him to control your life? Yes, absolutely. Why? Look what he did on the cross to pay for your sins. You wicked, vile sinner, you. Wicked, vile sinner. The stuff I've done and he had to die on the cross for that. And then he has enough grace to save me. Uh, it's my reasonable service to, to give him my life. Verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. Hmm. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be not conformed to this world. Huh, almost like back there in Leviticus 20, I've severed you from the world. Almost, you know, almost. It's, it's almost the same. It's just not the same because we're Christians now and we don't have to, to quite have these standards and real strict things and you can't do this and you can't do that. And, and Uh-huh. Um... You're severed from the lost world. You're not to be conformed to the world. And I mean, it's, it's getting so easy now. It's not even that difficult to prove this. The whole, all these weird people out there. The face mask thing, brethren, it's all about it just destroying your health. And they're coming out and they're saying, there's no science to say that it hurts you. You can wear a face mask all the time. It won't affect you. You know, I mean, I got into a comment debate thing with some nurse. And uh, that got offended at one of my comments, and um, and she said, I she said I said to her, uh, I said simple question, I said, uh, what's better for your health, CO2, what you breathe out, or oxygen? And she came back and she said, well, there's no such thing as a room that's pure oxygen. Uh, it doesn't affect us. And I said, I said to her, I said, well, look up the mortality rate of do doctors and medical professionals. They die young. Uh, give me one reputable article. You know, like I'm supposed to do the work for, you know. Google it. <laughs> okay, article after article after article after article. They die young. All right. Oh, it's, it's perfectly fine. Doctors wear face masks all day. Yeah, that's why they're crazy in the head. A lot of these guys. And women too. I can't forget that. I got to, you know. But anyhow, let's continue. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. What they're trying to do with this whole thing, this whole wear the mask thing, they're just trying to destroy people's immune systems, bring the immune system down so that in the future they'll die quicker when 
famine comes and, and war and whatever else, these people are already having their immune systems compromised by wearing the face mask all the time. I mean, you can see it. It doesn't, this isn't even, well, that's just your theory. Look at the people that you go to the store and they are always wearing the face mask. You can see it, you know? There's an older woman at a grocery store not far from here and, and just, I mean, she's just barely, you know, moving. She got the face mask on thing and I'm thinking, you're killing yourself here. And you try to talk to somebody, oh, the government said to do it. I'm like, you know, and they almost look at you like you're the one that's, that's mentally ill. Um, you know, I mean, oh, but we have to wear the face masks because the, I'll get back to the sermon here in a minute. But, you know, we have to wear these face masks because somebody might sneeze near you and their spit might go in your mouth and then you die. Oh, oh wait, you don't actually die because then you, you get sick and then you have to go home. You might be asymptomatic. You have the coronavirus, but you don't really know that you have the coronavirus. But you, if you do have the coronavirus, then you should go home and lock yourself in your bedroom and stay there until it goes away. Uh, then it's not deadly. Quarantine yourself because you got the deadly coronavirus. I mean, it's just so insane. There's a spiritual aspect to this whole thing, brethren. That's what you need to understand. There is a spiritual thing going on here that God is destroying the wicked. He's starting to judge the wicked. And this whole face mask thing, this whole coronavirus thing, I literally heard that a relative, my brother-in-law's younger sister, youngest sister, um, she is literally her and her family um, have, have not left their home since March of this year. March, April, May, June, and we're in July. Five months of quarantining themselves in their home, ordering everything online, ordering things, getting things coming in. That's mental illness. Okay, that's, that's mental illness. I mean, how many times, you know, going out there in public and whatever else in the past, people say, oh, there's some kind of bug going around, you know, some kind of thing going around. I remember that for so many years and people sneezing and people hacking and coughing and, you know, whatever else, and you shake people's hands and you, you know, you open up doors and you, whatever else, next thing you know, you have the sickness or whatever. And it's, oh, it's a kind of a cold, sore throat, you know, runny nose type of deal. And you have it and you have it for a couple of days, a week or two or something, if it's really bad. This is back before I was even into natural health. Now I don't even get that stuff, but, but, you know, back years ago, I'd get those things and, you know, you, you get over it. You're fine. Some people, you know, it got really bad for, you know, an older person or something and they died. That's normal life. You know, now all of a sudden we're not allowed to have normal life anymore. Now all of a sudden we have to uh, make it some kind of an international emergency or some kind of a thing that people get sick and die. I mean, it's insane. You know, and just ignore the statistics of things that are real killers like cancer or AIDS or something. Just ignore that stuff because it dwarfs the numbers of the coronavirus supposed deaths, which that's, you know, messed up as well. But it's just, it's insane. It is a spiritual deception. I believe it's part of the strong delusion that the Lord is sending upon those who had pleasure in unrighteousness. So you, you want to see who God's judging? Look at the people that are wearing the face masks. Look at the people whose health is gradually going down, who are quarantining themselves for months on end. They're under God's judgment. So, <laughs> but 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we'll get back to the study now on holiness. Verse 16 through 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? There's a thought. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Are you holy? How are you doing with your standards of holiness, Christian? You say, well, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I hear, I've heard professing Christians, they'll say, well, I'm no saint, you know, I, I do a little thing once in a while. Well, then you're not saved. If you can say, if it comes out of your mouth, I'm no saint, um, and, and you're saying that because you're messing around in sin and not willing to give it up, um, you're not saved. You're not born again. You've never experienced the new birth that comes when you truly get, when the Lord saves you, say it that way. Um, temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Um, well, yeah, but you know, uh, not really. Uh, then get saved. 
get ready for that changed life that comes after salvation. Well, you know, uh, it doesn't have to be there and everything. I hear this from these lost, wicked devils. Uh, yes, it does. Yes, it absolutely does. But let's go next to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20. I mean, it's, it's just such a dumb you know, thing, just a simple thing to think about. Um, I, I can get saved and nothing has to happen. Nothing, no, nothing really changes. Uh, really? So the, the, your body becomes a temple of God and the Holy Ghost moves into your body and nothing happens? <laughs> uh, no drastic things happen. He severs you from the lost world. He starts to sanctify you. And as you are sanctified, you become more and more holy. That's why lost people will look at you a lot of times and they'll say, Oh, you're so holier than thou. Yes. Yes. See, one of the lost people, lost world's favorite tactics is to badger you and to beat you and say, How dare you think that you're better than me? How dare you say that you're holier than me and that you, you've, you're going to do this? And you, and, and they'll get you to kind of back down. Well, oh, well, yeah, because you think of yourself as, well, I'm only a sinner saved by grace, you know. So, I mean, certainly I shouldn't take too hard of a stand against sin because, I, you know, I was a sinner once too and I understand. And, and, you, and you start to kind of back down. Well, okay, yeah, you know, and, and you back down and you back down and you back down. And pretty soon you're getting away from the Lord because you've backed down so much. I've been guilty of that. I've had people around me and whatever else the little little imps that left this ministry not long ago and whatever, there was sin there. I didn't rebuke it. There was stuff, you know, because I, I used to struggle with some of that stuff myself. I struggled with it, though, see? I wasn't defending it like they were doing it. And if you're a young man, young woman, or even older or whatever else, and you're messing around in sin, I have to ask you the question, are you struggling with that sin? I get letters all the time, people struggling in sin. I won't judge you. All right. But if I get a letter and it says, well, you know, I don't think you should take such a strong stand against whatever. Uh, now you're defending your sin. Now I have a problem with you. Now I start thinking that you're false. But let's continue here. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 18 through 20. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The Holy Spirit lives within you, if you're genuinely born again, if you are genuinely saved. But you don't have to be holy, because that's just, you know, that's pharisaical. <laughs> um, no, you have to be holy. And it's going to tick off the lost world. Like I said, I'm, I mean, again, I remember being a teenager and we would listen to Metallica and they had a song literally called Holier Than Thou, you know, and they were, you know, all angry and, and, and they would say, judge not lest ye be judged yourself, which the Bible doesn't even say, <laughs> you know, that's their own made up version of it. But uh, they have a problem with people that are holy because see, people that are holy will stand against music like Metallica. People that are holy will say, hey, that's wrong. That's wicked. Hey, there's tattoos all over those guys. That's wicked. That's, you shouldn't be doing that. Hey, that, that uh, profanity that they're using, that's, that's wrong too. And that, they're going out and having parties and drinking and cigarettes and, and drugs and whatever. That stuff's wrong. That's, see, we're supposed to remind people of the Lord. That's what the real deal is here. But you get ashamed of the Lord sometimes. And you want to fit in with the lost world. And so you start to drop your level of holiness. You know, and I, just think of this here, you know, just give you something to think about. Um, you say, well, what is, what is sin? How do you, how do you really, you know, prove what is sin and what's not? Um, just very simple. If you do it every day, whatever this thing is, you do it every day for the next 20 years, are you going to be better or worse? It's just that simple. If I read my Bible every day for the next 20 years, is it going to make me better as a Christian or worse? Better. Um, if I play video games every day for the next 20 years, will it make me better or worse? Worse. Absolutely. Well, I don't agree with it. Well, then get saved. Okay? Because you're lost. 
quite simple. And you go down through the list, any kind of a thing, anything. Is this going to help my life? Is this going to make me more holy or less holy? You know that what you're struggling with because the Holy Spirit of God right now is convicting you of it. Oh, it's just your opinions down there. Oh, okay. Kick the preacher, attack the preacher. They just ignore the Holy Spirit, who's the one that's really convicting you. Ephesians chapter 1, let's go there next. The Bible talks about evil communications corrupting good manners. You better be very careful who you're around. They should help you to become more holy. If they're genuinely saved, they can, should convict you. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, and look at this, and without blame before him in love. Now, how many people actually believe that? Holy and without blame. Oh, well, you know, we're all sinners. You know, we, we all sin from time to time. We all struggle with sin, so it just... you. You don't have to really concern yourself too much with this holiness. It's not what it says. See, the church building thing has ruined this country, America. Church buildings ruin any country because church buildings allow you to have two different lives. I act a certain way while I'm in church, but then when I'm at home, I'm no longer in church, spiritual problem there, because you're supposed to be in church all the time if you're saved. Church, The church is the body of Christ. It's not some stupid building, but when you're at home, then you're not in church, so then you can act differently. So guess what? I mean, who does that really appeal to? Saved people or lost people? It appeals to lost people. That's why the vast majority of these church buildings throughout time have been built by lost people. Occasionally you get some kind of a, a Christian that would be, you know, that starts to get a little bit worldly and they don't want to, you know, be considered as some fringe group or whatever else. And they'll, they'll say, well, you know, and they'll compromise and they'll build some, some church building or whatever else. Uh, I'm not going to say that everybody that's ever attended a church building is lost. That's not true. Uh, I get that thing put on me. But what I'm saying is right now, after all that's coming out, um, if you're still attending one and you're defending, remember, defending versus struggling, if you're defending the church building thing, then yeah, I'd have to say that you're lost. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's weird. It's disgusting, this whole church building thing. And uh, I was talking with a brother about this, and he said, I think that the whole problem with the debt-based system here in America actually comes from the church buildings because you have these you know, people that go to these church buildings and they're, they're not being taught to be debt-free. They're not being, you know, they're, they're going there and, and you know, you have some preacher stand up and say you shouldn't be in debt. And you know, people are looking around saying, okay, what did this building cost? You know, and, and it's just hypocrisy the whole time. And the Lord never told anybody to build a church building, you know, in the New Testament there. We're supposed to have different standards. We're supposed to be without blame. Ephesians chapter 5. I mean, you're connected to the Lord. Did you, you know, don't forget that. The Holy Ghost is within you if you're saved. Don't give me this thing that you can just go on living in sin and messing around in sin and just no conviction about it. I mean, if you're saved, you know when you sin. You know, you know, you're messing around with things that you shouldn't mess around with. The Lord will convict you. You know, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Standards of holiness. Well, yeah, you know, it's it's kind of there, I guess. You know, we can we can kind of look at some of that. And we can kind of see. You know, how do you ignore this stuff? Be holy, for I am holy. 
back there in the, the, the book of uh, First Peter, Leviticus. Oh, we could just ignore this. It's, it's all throughout here. Holy and without blemish. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. We'll stop there. Now, Again, there's so many scriptures that can prove the thing of a changed life and good works that follow true conversion. Okay? False works are things that keep you saved. Okay? Like the Catholic Church. You have to come to Mass. You have to go to the Eucharist thing and whatever else. You have to do sacraments, the, the seven sacraments. Those are all works that you do throughout your life to maintain salvation. You are continually being saved. That's works that the Bible condemns. I go to church, therefore I will one day go to heaven. I am, I am baptized and I give to you know, my tithe and I confess my sins to the priest. and I, you know, Those are all false works. Uh, I wear uh, all black and I, I ride around in an Amish buggy and I live without electricity. Their thing, not our, what we do here. I don't do this to be saved. I do it because it makes sense. Um, but, you know, we live off grid if you don't know that I'm saying. But uh, see... The Amish standards, we drive around an Amish buggy, we're not conforming to the world, we're just conforming to standards that don't appear in the Bible. Wouldn't that be conforming to the world? Uh, whatever. But, you know, people do all sorts of things to, to merit salvation, to work their way to heaven. And every single one of those people believes that, that if they stop doing those works, that they're damned and they go to hell and they've lost, you know, they could, they could do good works, be a good Catholic for 70 years and the last five years of their life, they, they stopped going and whatever to the mass and whatever else, and they, they, they didn't die in a state of grace. You know, they'll have to go to purgatory perhaps for a while and burn for a while or something. See, that's the works that the Bible condemns. But when the Bible says you come to the Lord by, by faith, you know, and God's grace is there, and you believe the scriptures, and you repent, all right? See, you come, you're coming as a sinner, Again, you know, I'm not going to go through the whole gospel thing. It's just, it's plain there. But let's look at the, the scriptures again. Verse 21, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, the Lord will judge a lost person by their works. Absolutely. You think that they can live in sin, the Lord's just going to say, well, they're not saved, so I can't really judge them by what they're doing. <laughs> okay, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Lord just didn't look down and say, well, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, they're not saved, so technically they can't understand this stuff, so uh, he's judging them by their works. Lost people will be judged by their works. You know, you see about the thing of the, the ministers of Satan uh, over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I believe it is, and it says, whose end shall be according to their works. God judges lost people by their works says so it right there. Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. You were doing wicked stuff back there in the past. Now that you're saved, you're supposed to be holy, unblameable, unreprovable. Stop the sinning. Okay? It's always going to be there. It's always going to be a struggle. You can't be sinlessly perfect. People that say that are, are lying to you. They're the holiness crowd and whatever else. But the point is, the Bible says, awake to righteousness and sin not. You're supposed to be awake to righteousness, awake to holiness, realizing, hey, you know what? God saved me. I'm supposed to be holy as my heavenly Father is holy. There's supposed to be a difference here. If there's sin in my life, I need to get victory over that sin and get it out of the way. If you struggle with pornography, you need to get victory over it. I had victory over the sin of pornography. I got victory over that. Video games, I got victory over that. I never had a problem with drinking alcohol. I always, you know, 
tried some wine at one time and things a couple times and, and it, it, you know, tried different types, you know, in other words, and it was just, this stuff is disgusting. It tastes like cough syrup to me. You know, I'm not going to judge somebody for drinking a little bit or whatever else and stuff. That's the Bible doesn't condemn small amounts of wine. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, you know, a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Recommending it to him. True fermented wine, which is not very high alcohol content because fermented, you know, things are good for you, especially good for your gut health side issue. But, you know, drunkenness, I've never gotten drunk one day in my life. Never. It doesn't happen. Um, so there's really no need to get victory over that sin because it was never a sin in the first place in my life. Oh, you're so holier than thou, Denlinger. Oh, you, well, if you're lost, then yes, I am holier than you. Absolutely. I'm to be holy because my God is holy. And he told me, be holy for I am holy. So yes, I am holier than you out there. Absolutely. The Lord has helped me to get a lot of victory over sin. And I'll tell you what, a lot of it was, you want to be a preacher? you want to be able to preach this book and have me do things through the ministry, then you need to get victory over this and you need to quit doing that. You need to stop doing this. And you need to stop doing that. And there's still sin. I still struggle with sin, but you know what? Um, compared to a lot of the wicked people out there, I'm a lot better than they are. Why? Because I have years and years and years of sanctification. The Lord's saying, get that out of your life. Get this out of your life. Get that out of your life. That's why you listen to older men. That preach. God doesn't call young men and whatever else to say, you know, hey, you're, this guy's 18, get up in the pulpit and start, you know, not in the pulpit, but, you know, get out there and start uh, preaching and teaching and things of the Word of God. You don't have enough experience, All right? Young men can do things for the Lord. Young men can witness for the Lord. You can write on different subjects and things, but to say, I'm going to be up there as an overseer, as an elder, uh, you don't have the experience. You haven't gone through enough. The Lord was 30 when he started his earthly ministry. You're not better than him. Watch out for young men that are in their teens and their 20s that are coming out and talking down older men. There's a problem there. Next, let's go to Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. And see, that's what the world hates, by the way. I just got to say this. The world hates a righteous preacher saying, I am holier than you because of Christ's righteousness, because of the Lord sanctifying things out of my life. You get around lost people, and uh, I, I don't, can't tell you how many times I've been around lost people, and uh, they say, hey, what do you do for a living? I say, I'm a preacher. And all of a sudden, whoop, the speech cleans up, and it's, oh, well, you know, and people get really nervous and things. Can't tell you how many times that's happened. Happens all the time. I pull in with one of my vehicles that has, you know, gospel magnets on it and whatever else, and all of a sudden people's speech cleans up. Guys are taking their cigarettes and putting them down, stomping them out and things. Holier than thou? There's old holier than thou Denlinger. Crazy nut that he is. Yeah. Hello. You think I'm gonna say, oh yeah, don't put your cigarette out. Oh, don't you just just continue with your profanity. Stop your cussing around me. Put that cigarette out, it stinks. Hey, that shirt that you're wearing is filthy. I want to be holier than the lost world. Again, why wouldn't you want to be holier than the people out there that are lost? Why do you want to cling to sin and hold on to your sin? Why? It's messed up. Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy... And beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. It's talking about saved people, by the way. Not You don't forbear with a bunch of lost, wicked people out there. <laughs> if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness among the body of Christ. This stuff isn't true for people out there that are in the lost world. You don't owe them anything except to live holy and righteously before them. To let them see, hey, I'm not like you. And I'm not like these other professing Christians out there. 
Verse 15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Another easy way to kick sin. Um, whatever you do in word or deed, it's to be for the glory of God. Jesuits like to pervert that for the greater glory of God. You know, they, they say, well, they're ad majorium de glorium. Yeah, a bunch of wicked devils. Uh, they deserve the, the death and, and then hell for all of eternity that they're going to be getting. When you understand the, the pedophilia and all the other stuff that these people do, whatever. Um, but don't let the lost world, you know, stealing of, of things that are written to you, don't let that uh, make you feel, well, I shouldn't say, you know. No, you say it because the Bible says it. Uh, just as simple as that. But um, whatever you do, you're supposed to do it all to the glory of God. Um, how can you do that without being holy? Well, I don't want to have such standards of holiness that uh, other people get offended. And uh, You're supposed to have standards of holiness, Christian. We're not supposed to be like the lost world. God has severed us from the lost world. We're supposed to be different. You know, if you own a, a store as a Christian, um, don't put on worldly music. Put on hymns. Instrumental hymns, hymns if you want to, if you don't want to have the words playing or whatever else. I think it'd be better to just have the words playing, you know, lightly in the background and things. Um, put out gospel tracks. Do whatever you can. Say, well, what if I lose business? <laughs> then maybe the Lord doesn't want you in that business. Do you trust God? You go to work. Oh, here's old holier than thou. Well, thank you. I'm glad that you realize that I'm holier than you. If you read the Bible, if you get saved, then you could be holy as well and wouldn't have to live a life struggling with that sin. Second Corinthians chapter 6. You're never going to be able to make peace with the lost world, brethren. You can't ever get to a point where they, they like you and they think that you're neat and whatever else. If, if, if the Lord... If the lost world likes you, then you're in trouble with God. Just that simple. The lost world is not going to think that you're a good person and whatever else. They're going to hate you. They're going to cast out your name as evil. They're going to say you're crazy and, you know, holier than thou. This is the way it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Holy people, be ye holy, for I am holy. God wants you to have standards of holiness, Christian. You're not supposed to be like the lost world. You're supposed to be separate from them. And it's so easy to do now. Don't wear a face mask. Hey, you need to have a face mask on. My God provides for my health. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And no wicked devil that was trained by the Jesuits is going to tell me any different. I've been through sickness. I've been through other things. The Lord has healed me. How simple it is today to take a stand for Jesus Christ. Hey, the churches are shutting down. Good. Good. Well, the churches can't sing the hymns anymore and they have to go in and they have to have their forehead scanned with a heat thing and they have to put on a face mask and whatever else. Good. Praise the Lord. I can't. It's, it's, that's good news. 
You say, how can that be good news? Because they were false from the beginning. God's not for the church buildings. He never told anybody to build a church building in here. He never said, hey, uh, Paul, make sure you go to Antioch, get a good fund going and stuff, and go out there and get yourself in debt and, you know, borrow some money from the first Roman bank or whatever. You know, build this nice church building. And then you invite the saved and lost to it. Right there, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 down through 17, proves that church buildings are wicked. Proves that you're not supposed to have lost and saved in fellowship together. Proves it. God severed you from among the lost if you're saved. So how e easy it is it to uh, live for the Lord right now? Very easy. It's very simple. All you have to do is just not conform. Be separate. I'm not wearing it. Lord's giving you a chance. I see a lot of people in the comments. Well, we're, we're forced to wear it. Um, yeah, people will be forced one day to take the mark of the beast. If you're saved, you won't be here for it. I realize that. But uh, what an opportunity to witness. Um, go in, uh, uh, boss. Uh, I, I, I can't wear the mask. Why? Well, because it goes against my religious convictions. You see, the Bible says, the Lord's giving you a golden opportunity to stand up. I'm not wearing a mask. I've been confronted. Uh, sir, you need to have a mask on. No, no, I don't. So I told one woman, no, I'm not wearing one. I can't, sorry. And it was, oh, okay, well, uh, all right. And I just walked right past her, went into the store. You say, well, what about the store that they would say, okay, but you can't, oh, then don't go to the store. Go someplace else. There's ways to get around this thing, but people, you know, you can go and you can order the stuff online and come and they, they'll put it in your trunk and whatever else, you know, because the deadly coronavirus, it's not really deadly, you know, might get you. <laughs> you know, there's ways to get around it, but people aren't even trying it. They're just saying, well, I have no choice. I just have to go along with it. I just have to do what the world's doing. No, you don't. No, you don't. I mean, brethren, um, remember, years ago, Christians would be told you have to go to the Catholic Church. You have to be there at Mass. And if you don't, you're a heretic. Teaching the Lord's Prayer or teaching parts of Scripture to a child would get the whole family burned to death at the stake. Children taken from the family, and they would do it. We're going to teach our child the Bible. Well, that's, that's illegal. That's against the law. Whatever, we're going to do it. And yet today, uh, you're forced to wear a face mask, and you say, well, I better just go along with it. A face mask? You can't take a simple stand against it? There's no science behind the thing. You're covering your, your I mean, if God designed you, you know, if you had some kind of a thing that this is a protection from viruses, don't you think the Lord would make some kind of a skin flap or something that just automatically kind of drops down if there's a virus in the area or something, you know? Um, God made you to live out in the natural environment, to breathe in oxygen and viruses too. You get a virus, your body, if you're in good health, if you're taking care of yourself, you'll be fine. You see somebody that's truly sick, what do you do? Help them with nutrition. Pray for the sick. You know, it doesn't say uh, put the, a mask on the sick and put a mask on yourself. You know, and th th these people, you know, have no idea why they're wearing these masks. It's science falsely so called. I say, well, why do you keep going off about this? Because it's such a simple thing here. You want to show that you're separate from the world? You want to show that I'm not conforming to the world? Stop wearing face masks. Simple. It's just right here, right in front of our faces now. I thank the Lord for anybody who's not conforming to this thing. And if you are conforming to it, that's a problem. It's a big problem. Chapter 7 and verse 1 there in 2 Corinthians. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, these promises, be separate from the lost world. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. 
cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Oh, well, you know, it's okay if you do a little bit of this. You're not cleansing yourself. You look in your life and you say, anything goes, Lord. Whatever you want me to give up, you tell me. You convict me about it. My wife, a while back, uh, probably a couple years ago, she was wearing earrings. And I said, uh, you know, what's the, what's, where did this whole thing come from? I mean, in the Bible, earrings were worn by slaves. You know, and where did the thing come from? Whatever else she did, a little bit of study into it. She said, took them out. She said, let's destroy them. I'm not wearing earrings again. I praise the Lord for my wife because her convictions about, you know, separation and standards and things is a lot better than mine. She's got much stronger convictions. Um, and I thank the Lord for that. She sees something's wrong and she just says, boom, done. I'm not going to mess with it. That's the way Christians should be. There should be standards of holiness there. Not, well, you know, I kind of tried that for a while and then I kind of went back to it and whatever. You need to have convictions. We're to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Perfecting holiness. Perfecting holiness. That's a process, brethren. Well, I got saved and, and, you know, I fell back into this and I fell back into that. Okay, then stop falling. Awake to righteousness and sin not. New Testament. Okay? Paul and epistles. Can't duck it. Um, sin not. Stop it. Quit it. You say, well, Brian, I, I fell. Okay, then get up. Dust yourself off and get back in the fight. Quit your sinning. Cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness. How? In the fear of God. That's where we're going to end it because that's where it does end. If you fear God, if you realize, hey, you know what? Someday I'm going to stand before my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Someday my works are going to be tried by fire. All the works that don't supposedly matter, you know. Um, you're going to stand there and you're going to watch your life be judged after your salvation. You say, well, I thought we escaped judgment. You escaped the judgment of God being sent to hell, but you don't escape judgment. The Lord's going to judge you. He's going to try your works. And uh, you say, well, yeah, but, you know, I'm, we're not going to, it's not any kind of negative thing. It's just your works and kind of a little reward ceremony or something. You know, you get to the end of the level of Super Mario Brothers and the little coins go ding, 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 ding. You know, uh, no, that's not it. Why? Because the Bible says that your works, if they're burned, you will suffer loss. You're going to realize when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ, just how much time you wasted. You're going to realize it. And I'm going to realize it as well. We're going to realize, we're going to get there, and there's going to be some shame. And God doesn't wipe away all tears, by the way, until after the great white throne judgment. There's going to be crying, and there's going to be shame when we get to heaven. There will be. So why not try to make it as little as possible by cleansing yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit? sanctification. God, sanctify this stuff out of my life. I want to be holy as you are holy. I want to remind people of you. I want to be your representative here on this earth. I don't want to be like the lost world. That's the way it's supposed to be. And you know what? Next time somebody comes up to you and they say, you know what? You're holier than thou. You're one of these holier than thou people. Badge of honor, brethren. Thank you. Boy, I appreciate that. I'm glad that you lost people out there realize that I have a higher standard of holiness than you do. Praise the Lord for that. Don't be ashamed. Oh, you're so holy. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, you're some kind of religious Pharisee. No, actually, because I don't hold my traditions above the Scriptures. I hold the Scriptures as my final authority. So no, technically I'm not a Pharisee, but I understand why you, wicked devil, have called, called me a Pharisee. It's because you see my standards of holiness, the Lord getting things sanctified out of my life, and your only defense is to call me a Pharisee. 
to say that I have works salvation. I don't have works salvation. Jesus Christ saved me in the past and now he's doing works, meet for repentance in my life. The Lord's telling me what to do and I'm cleansing this out of my life and I'm getting that out of my life and whatever else. Because you see, my God is holy. He's perfect. And He gives me His holiness. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I mean, what a defense that would be. Hey, you need to put a, a, a face mask on. Sorry, can't do that. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Try that one. Um, you, you, need to, you need to protect yourself or protect others, whatever the thing is, with this face mask. No, sorry, can't do that. Because I, the Bible doesn't say to do that. This doesn't say to put a face mask on. And there was sickness and things back there in the Old Testament, back in the New Testament. Here, oh, you've got to put a face mask on. Well, they, they had leprosy. I think they'd have to cover their face and say unclean and whatever else. But uh, that's leprosy. It's not a little thing that's like the flu. So, God help you to do right, brethren. God help you. Um, God help me. We all need to do right. We all need to do a better job. We need to be holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight. When the Lord shows up, uh, we shouldn't be embarrassed. Lord shows up and, oh, I shouldn't have been doing that. Wouldn't it be nice if what's left behind, whatever it is, there's a lot of debate, you know, your clothes, Ruckman said your blood, there's some questions on that. Um, some people say, well, your body's going to be left behind at the rapture. Well, that's stupid because you become, you know, your body is changed. You don't get a new body in the sense of your old body's just there on the ground and whatever else. Um, no, your, your body goes up. Okay, and it's changed. It's a resurrection. There's no point in having a resurrection if your body, it's just, you just, your dead body's there and then you get this new body. It's just, you know, that's not resurrection. Okay. <laughs> but uh, whatever's left behind, whatever's left behind, wouldn't it be neat if your Bible's on the table there? Hymns playing. People look in your refrigerator, there's no alcohol. They look on the shelf, there's no cigarettes. There's no television in that house, apartment, wherever it is you live. They look through your books, it's all stuff about the Lord. Wouldn't that be neat? Your vehicle. Vehicle uh, careens off and slams into something when the Lord catches you up. They get in there, there's hymns playing. There's a Bible there. Wouldn't it be nice that you could be unblameable and unreprovable and holy when the Lord comes back? How are you doing? How are your standards of holiness? I pray the Lord judges you on it. Between you and Him, I can't get in jump through the camera here into your living room or wherever you're watching this video and say, okay, hey, I'm looking here. What are you doing with that? What is this? You don't, you don't do that, do you? I can't do that. But the Holy Spirit can if you're saved. If you're, if you're messing around with sin, brethren, you got to stop. So that's going to be it for this study. Remember that this week. Your standards of holiness should remind people of God. God has one of His attributes is that He's holy. And He tells you that you're supposed to be the same way. I hope it's been a conviction to you because I know it has been to me. Um, there's times I start to mess around in sin and I, I kind of get blindsided. And, and uh, you know, I, I start thinking about things and covetousness you know, whatever else, stuff like that. And I think, oh boy, I'm sorry, Lord. And repent, get back to work for the Lord. You know, so I pray you do the same thing. That is going to be it. And uh, there's going to be a total of seven of these videos, a call to 
and I can't think of what the other one is right now, the next one, but uh, be coming out with that before real long. Um, please do keep us in your prayers. We greatly appreciate that. And um, so that is going to be it. And we will see you in the next study. Thank you for watching. Remember your standard, brethren. Hold it high. This is your standard. You know what? Maybe instead of going out to the store with a face mask, maybe you ought to go with the Bible. See what happens. Uh, sir, you need to have a face mask on. I can't because my Bible says not to. Try it. What's the worst that could happen? Just walk in. A lot of times people avoid you if you walk around with a, with a King James Bible especially. Just put it under your arm, walk into a store. Do, 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 do. <laughs> what are they going to do? Sir, you can't bring a Bible in here. Oh, really? Why not? What's wrong with the Bible? Are you afraid of the Bible? Are you going to persecute me because of my religious convictions? What's wrong with you? You know? Well, I wouldn't want to come off holier than thou. <laughs> see what I'm saying? So, all right, that's going to be it. We'll see you in the next video.